It is recognized that you have a funny sense of fun. So I'm here in Austin, Texas right now because the amazing and historic Paramount Theater downtown is showing a few films on glorious 70 millimeter film as a part of their summer series. And see, I've wanted to talk about 70 mil for a while now because it's something that I love, but I don't want to do the normal thing of just waxing lyrical about the, the look and the texture and the feel of it because it's something I'm sure most of you already have your minds made up about. You either like 70 mil or you don't, and both are completely fine. So here's the angle that I want to take. Why? Why does it exist? Why is it a thing? Is it really just because the quality is supposedly better? Or are there other reasons? And to answer that, we have to go back in time. Our story starts in the late 1940s when two key events took place. The first was this, United States versus Paramount Pictures, Inc., a landmark antitrust case that completely changed the way movies were produced and distributed. See, before this, film studios wielded significantly more power than they currently do. Not only did they have all of their actors, directors, writers, and craftsmen all under contract, and also owned and controlled the laboratories that developed their films and created the release prints that were sent to the theaters, but in some cases, they outrightly owned the specific theater chains where the films played. Far worse than that, though, was the fact that studios would often force independent theater owners into a practice called block booking. Let me explain. If you're an independent theater owner and you want to show a print of one of Paramount's big upcoming films, the only option usually offered was to sign a contract. That meant you'd receive that company's entire output for a given amount of time, easily over 100 films. A-list films, B-movies, even films that hadn't been made yet. And in many cases, the studios could set their rates high enough to guarantee the success of any given film. And all of that translated to vertical integration, and by extension meant that the film industry was, in effect, an oligopoly. The Supreme Court came in and ruled to prohibit block booking and the practice of studios owning and operating their own theater chains which opened up the overall film industry to competition from independent producers and exhibitors. However, the decision sent big studio owners in an absolute panic, as it meant a major blow to their wallets, a panic that was only intensified by our second key event, the emergence of this little guy. You can tune in this wonderful new Westinghouse television set with just one hand like this, because it has the sensational new Westinghouse single dial control. Both of these events meant that the studios were forced to do the thing that they've never liked to do. Innovate. Oh, yeah. So I've been here to the Paramount a few times in my life, and it's far and away one of my very favorite theaters to go to. It's one of those great old movie palaces with just one screen that are harder and harder to come by. And it really offers an entirely different experience than what you'd get at your regular neighborhood fast food multiplex. Thank you guys so much, and I'm so glad you could be here today to watch Lawrence of Arabia on Glorious 70 millimeter. Um, this is a movie directed by David. And see, that's the thing the entire film industry had to do. In the same way that today, seeing a film at a place like the Paramount is an entirely different experience than seeing a film at, a, at an AMC or a Cinemark, the studios and theaters in the early 1950s had to ante up and offer audiences an experience that they could never get anywhere else. Now in complete control! See, for over 50 years, this is the only way that mass audiences saw films, in a very simple, boxy 1.37 to 1 aspect ratio. But then, all of that changed. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cinerama. <laughs> There have been efforts as far back as the 1920s at developing widescreen technology. 
1927, French director Abel Gantz helped develop a process dubbed polyvision for the final sequence in his epic Napoleon. But Cinerama was the first sign that widescreen technology was at all commercially viable. This is how they did it. The standard process of cinema has always been one camera capturing one image that's then shown by one projector. But Cinerama tripled that process, using three cameras lined up side by side, each shooting a single 35mm image at a 1.37 aspect ratio that were then simultaneously projected on a curved screen, yielding an absolutely overwhelming image. That combined with a multi-track magnetic sound system, a first for any movie theater, provided an experience that audiences had never before witnessed. So that's the new technique. Motion pictures breaking away from their old, narrow restrictions. New York Times film critic Bosley Crowther called it sensational, but also questioned how such a process could be used across multiple layers of cinematic storytelling. How could Cinerama be used for something like intimacy? As an attraction, this was exciting and breathtaking, but the limitations of the format were glaring. The entire system operated with fixed 27mm lenses, which meant that the use of telephoto glass was impossible. And because of the highlighted curvature of the image, this was just about the closest close-up you could get. And as you can imagine, the process was both wildly expensive and completely impractical outside of Cinerama's own special venue theaters. The idea of an independent theater owner shelling out to upgrade for three projectors on just one screen was simply never going to take off. But still, Cinerama's ambition was undeniable. The film industry at large saw its initial success and set off developing a variety of distinct widescreen technologies. And from such developments came both anamorphic 35mm, jump-started with 20th Century Fox's The Robe in 1953, and 70mm. Michael Todd was one of the co-founders of Cinerama, but resigned just before the company began showcasing their films in order to go off and develop his own widescreen process with the American Optical Company that would, in his view, rectify Cinerama's shortcomings. Cinerama out of one hole. The result was the Todd AO process. And instead of producing a widescreen image by altering the lenses used, the process went straight to the film strip itself, increasing the size from 35 millimeters to 65, still to this day offering one of the highest resolutions available for a moving image. From that 65mm negative, a 70mm print was created for projection, the extra 5mm being used for additional stereophonic sound. Just as with Cinerama, others had experimented with the 70mm process earlier in film history, but Todd was the first to widely popularize its usage and to show its commercial viability, as the first films shot in the Todd AO process proved with thunderous results. 70 mil took off like a storm all throughout the 1950s and 60s, with other companies developing their own competing formats. Ultra Panavision 70 used anamorphic lenses, Super Panavision 70 used spherical, Super Technorama 70, Dimension 150, and then years later, IMAX. So one of the films that I'm seeing projected on 70 is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, which wasn't actually shot on 70. Shooting on the format was obviously much, 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 much more expensive than shooting on 35, but the benefits of the markedly superior sound system and the overall prestige factor associated with the format led many studios throughout the 1970s and 80s to grant special blow-up releases for films shot on 35, mostly blockbusters, things like Last Crusade, Back to the Future, The Empire Strikes Back, even The Little Mermaid got a release on 70. But the overall costs, later coupled with the introduction of high-quality digital sound systems in the early 90s, put the brakes on the majority of 70 mils usage. Like film overall, though, it's still something that's persisted and has been experiencing something of a minor comeback over the last several years, due to the works of directors like Christopher Nolan, Paul Thomas Anderson, Kenneth Branagh, and Quentin Tarantino. And again, I'm not gonna wax lyrical about it because all of you most likely have your minds made up. 
You're either on board for 70 or you're not or you just don't care, and any one of those is completely fine. But here's one last thing I'll leave you with. You can't really talk about 70mm without talking about the Roadshow style release. The two are intrinsically connected. Before a movie's general wide release, studios rolled out special engagements for their 70mm extravaganzas. This wasn't like what we now know as limited releases, where studios put their specialty features in a small handful of art houses to test the waters and only expand out wide if they prove successful. It was something else entirely. It was all about... Showmanship. Razzle, dazzle. Bravado. Showmanship. 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 The presentation. It treated going to the movies like you were going to a Broadway show. You want to wear a tank top? Mm. Wear a tux. You went to a movie palace that looked like this. Not some nasty theater held together by duct tape and a bunch of teenagers. You got a program. And who doesn't like a program? There weren't any commercials or trailers before the movie started. You got an overture, an intermission, exit music. This wasn't just some outing to take your day to so you can make out in the back row. It was a performance. It was something that this thing could never provide. And it was something that these helped kill. I'll look around. Along with the majority of 70 mil productions, the roadshow style of release began disappearing in the mid-1970s to be replaced by that limited release model. And if there's something that I think should be taken away from all of this, it's that showmanship quality. When the industry was in danger, the real innovation that arguably saved them wasn't 70 millimeter, it was showmanship. It was taking the theatrical experience and turning it into something so incredibly special. And I don't know if we get that too often these days.